Hi, and welcome to CARA Conference 2021, brought to you by CARACOL, Cincinnati's, um, or Greater Cincinnati's HIV Services Organization, um, devoted to positively changing lives in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Um, my name is Leah Majeski, and I am on the prevention team um, and here at CARACOL, and I'll be sharing some housekeeping reminders before we get started today. So welcome everyone. If you're not familiar with Caracol, we encourage you to visit our website. And um, if you're not already following us on social media, um, you can go ahead and do that. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and you can learn more about our work. <clears throat> so um, if you're like, most of us um, were pretty all well acquainted with Zoom, um, but if you're not, we still wanna just share a few things about Zoom. Um, so just to give you a few reminders. So please use the chat feature if you have any technical questions or any general questions or comments. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you have any questions for the presenter, um, use the Q&A function. Um, we'll be monitoring, monitoring the Q&A section um, and we'll provide um, those to the speaker when there's a natural break in the content. Um, as, far as, the Zoom, as far as Zoom, um, conti to continue the Zoom features, um, these are also available on your mobile device. So if you're um, going to listen to um, the panel today, you can also chat on um, your phone. We would also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, they are very generous and they've allowed us to offer this year's conference free of charge. Um, so we want to thank them. Um, Gilead Sciences, um, Vera Technologies, E19 Lounge and Bar, and Janssen. So we want to thank our sponsors and um, we really appreciate them. Um, this next slide is about um, something very important. Um, in the U.S., more than 32 states, including Ohio, have unjust, unjust and out dated HIV laws. Um, the Ohio Health Modernization Movement's mission is to replace those fear-based and stigmatizing laws with evidence-based non-discriminatory laws that protect public health. And if you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to ohmodernizenow.org. Um, so I do suggest that you look into this. It's uh, very important. Um, so at the end of today's session, please <clears throat> remember to fill out the evaluation that pops up at the end of the webinar. The link is located in your program. To receive CEUs, you must complete the evaluation before 5 p.m. today. Make sure you, so make sure you do that to receive credit. So, and now we're going to move on to today's session. Um, which is race and healthcare. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Jamar Jackson. And um, Jamar is fantastic. Um, Jamar is currently a health educator at Caracol. Um, so he works with me. Um, he is a health educator and he specializes in prevention and outreach. In his role, he helps to change the lives of those who are living with HIV, as well as he works to ensure the prevention of HIV um, in those in the high-risk communities. A native to Cincinnati, Jackson received his bachelor's degree in communications from the University of Cincinnati. In his short time at Caracol, he has successfully demonstrated his passion for those living with and at risk for HIV. He continues to exhibit, or I'm sorry, um, at risk for HIV, and he continues to exhibit the values of, of uh, Caracol and his work in the community. Prior to his work at Caracol, 
Jamar worked with various other populations, including homeless and at risk youth. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jamar, and he's going to introduce the panelists for today's session. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Jamar. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Leah. Um, again, I am Jamar Jackson. Um, I have the pleasure of being the moderator for our session today. Um, and without further ado, I would just like to go ahead and introduce um, our wonderful panel of speakers um, that we have today. Um, so we will begin with Ms. Stephanie Dodd. Um, she is a native to Cincinnati and works as the provider relations manager for Planned Parenthood Southwest Ohio. Um, where she began her employment um, for the past 10 years. Um, in her role, she forges mutually beneficial partnerships with other agencies, organizations, and providers, and engages them in learning more about Planned Parenthood's healthcare and educational services. Dodd explores with these organizations how she can help them access um, Planned Parenthood Southwest Ohio's direct and indirect services, including internal training and proper program development, her past experience as a health center assistant and then health center manager um, has equipped her to understand goals and needs of the communities that Planned Parenthood services. So please welcome Stephanie Dodd to the panel. All right, and then next we have Ms. Angelica Hardy. Um, she is a Cleveland, Ohio native and is a health equity leader, professor and vice president of health strategy at the American Heart Association. She received her bachelor's, master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Cincinnati, studying public health, health policy and global health systems. Dr. Hardy teaches the next generation of public health leaders at Tulane University School of Public Health and Topical Medicine. Tropical Medicine. Um, she is passionate about her community and previously served as a president of the Urban League Young Professionals of Greater Southwestern Ohio, board member for the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio and governing counselor of community health planning and policy development with the American Public Health Association. Dr. Hardy also serves as one of the executive board of the Hospice of Cincinnati, Cancer Justice Network, UC Community Advisory Board, St. Aloysius, Greater Cincinnati Regional Food Policy Council, and others. So please welcome Dr. Hardy to the panel. Next, we have Dr. Kirk D. Henney. Um, he is the Acting Associate Director for the Office of Health Equity and the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention at the Centers for Dis Disease Control. His, he received his bachelor's degree in sociology from James Madison University and his master's and doctoral degrees in medicine sociology from Howard University. His CDC experience includes extensive work in the field of HIV prevention and care as a behavioral scientist and epidemiologist. Dr. Henney has authored over 35 papers in scientific peer-reviewed journals and other publications. He researched ad addresses and a range of HIV-related topics, including HIV behavioral interventions for African-American heterosexual men, housing, interpersonal violence, e-health interventions, and other related topics. More recently, Dr. Henney completed a 120-day assignment as the Assistant Deputy of Program Operations for the Ending the HIV Academic Initiative. Additionally, Dr. Henney has been involved in several CDC emergency responses, including the 2015 Ebola response in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and the 2016 Zika response. So please everyone welcome Dr. Henney to the conversation. And last but not least, we have Dr. Charla Weiss. She is the director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center where she manages diversity and cultural competency programs for both non-clinical and clinical staff. Weiss received her master's degree from Indiana University and a doctoral degree in social, fit, social psychology, sorry, from the University of Michigan. She also works as an adjunct instructor at the UC College of Medicine. 
Prior to returning to Cincinnati in 2010, Weiss worked as an executive director for several San Francisco and East Bay organizations. Having lived in two countries and seven U.S. states, Weiss views the healthcare nonprofit area as a perfect niche for her curiosity and appreciation for people, culture, and change. Please welcome Mrs. Weiss, and we have our panel for our discussion. All right, and so to start it off, um, I guess I will start with a question for uh, Dr. Hardy. Um, so with that, um, just for your, um, your opinion, um, Americans of color experience better outcomes and higher quality healthcare when their providers are members of the community. Do you feel like this may be a true or a false statement? I definitely feel like it's true. Would you like to me to expand on that response? <laughs> uh, it's definitely true. Representation matters. Uh, trust is extremely important. Um, health literacy is also extremely important. We see that often um, when medical providers are also of color. Um, so we know increasing that within our communities plays a huge role in improving our health care, um, re reducing disparities, and just better understanding and communication. Um, so often when we see, when we have people of color and they see them in those places, there's already an initial trust and then they're able to continue to build that trust. So I won't go on because I know my <laughs> other panelists will have uh, things to add, but I definitely say, see that as a true statement. Pro um, providers of color is, are essential in every aspect, right? So from our physician, our medical assistant to, you know, all of the medical team, to our public health practitioners, I'll plug my, my peeps in there <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Um, Ms. Dodd, is there anything that you would like to add to that um, question as well? Yes, thank you, Jamara. Angelica, I thought that was a great response. I also agree uh, most definitely with me um, working at Planned Parenthood. I feel that uh, in reproductive health care and justice that, you know, um, it's one thing that our vice president always says is that when our community comes into the health center, they want to see people that look like them and that's reflective of, of the community that they're serving. So uh, at Planned Parenthood, although we do serve a diverse community. We make sure that our health centers are staffed with uh, members of the community that look like um, look like them. So we have uh, uh, centers that are primarily um, Spanish speaking and um, have Hispanic staff and are very diverse. We have health centers that's reflective of our community in Dayton and Springfield and um, Mount Auburn as well too, where some of our uh, staffs are primarily African-American and we have an African-American nurse practitioner. So that's great when, um, you know, we're having um, patients come in of uh, African-American descent and they see a nurse practitioner that's reflective of them and that they're able to speak freely um, about their concerns and have uh, unique feedback in that aspect. While both the speakers um, are stating the indirect effect of what happens when we do not, when the patient and that there's not, there's a lack of concurrence between the racial ethnic background between the patient and also the uh, provider. We're going, we're a long ways from someday that happening on a daily basis. Um, right now, the Hispanic black population and makes up uh, 18 to 12% respectively with the United States population, but we're only six to 5% of the physicians. So it's a long haul before we get to the point in which a person, a black indigenous person of color can walk into any clinic, any hospital and any center and feel that he or she will be, has an opportunity to see someone who mirrors their um, ethnicity and their race. My uh, mission right now until the day I retire um, is we need to increase the cultural competency of all physicians. Um, because right now our, our health depends upon their cultural competence. So when I take my biracial uh, children or my black children, or whatever, because I have adopted children and the United children, I need a white physician and a white nurse to understand that the children that, they, that I've placed before them and in their hands for care are not um, identical to the children that they go home to if they are a white, uh, white person. Um, so uh, we need to certainly applaud and increase and hire and develop um, persons who look like us 
but we really need also to reach our hand out and to educate, support, um, and in some cases correct our colleagues who are white and how they perceive um, the person and the child in front of them who does not mirror them and for them to understand black lives truly are different and they truly do matter. And it is upon them, they take an oath to treat them equitably, not equally. And, and, I, and I echo all of my colleagues' uh, uh, comments here. We really need to change the culture of, of healthcare um, across the board. Um, and that a big part of that, huge part of that is increasing the culture competency of our healthcare providers. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's imperative that um, providers are cognizant of the fact that the biases that they come into, and we all have biases. I mean, that's a, that's a huge, that, that you bring, bring to uh, your service um, and, and your care for patients. Um, and not so much even the explicit, because most times folks are thinking about the explicit expressions of racism or bias but it's really the implicit ones that are actually um, in some ways uh, more profound because it often goes unnoticed um, by the person who is perpetuating these implicit biases, but is definitely felt by those who are on the receiving end of those biases. So, you know, patients um, who uh, feel um, not welcomed because of how, who they are and whether that's by race, um, in many cases, I work in HIV prevention. Um, you know, your 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 perceived or expressed uh, of sexual orientation. Um, um, you know, or, or in in terms of your social economic status, um, that you get differences in the care that you're provided many times uh, because of that, uh, and because of that, that that then reduces the likelihood that those patients who are in need of critical services in many cases um, opt not to seek services um, from said providers um, and therefore uh, worsening their health outcomes. And, and so we have to be committed to not to really acknowledging that these implicit biases do exist um, from our service providers and working out on not only increasing uh, the look of the providers who provide these services, um, but even among those, if you don't share um, some of the background characteristics um, that you are, you have a, 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 the required competency to be able to communicate among, uh, among folks who do not look like you, um, who do not love the same types of folks that you may love, um, you know, it, 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 you know or, or, or come from the same side of the neighborhood, similar to where you, you are from. Um, it's important that uh, training, just, just as much as a, a provider needs to be trained up in the latest uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, tools and technology available to them as practitioners, uh, they, they also need to um, have the appropriate training and competency in terms of communicating uh, across an array uh, of, uh, of, of populations uh, among the uh, clientele that they serve. All right, well, thank you for you guys' input for that question. Um, and right now we do have a um, question from one of our attendees um, for the session. Um, the question reads, how can providers and medical centers get more people in leadership positions who are reflective of those they serve? Um, so Ms. Weiss, did you wanna take a um, stab at that question there? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um... It's not, a, it's not a, it's something we can change tomorrow in the next 24 hours, um, even 24 months. So what I'm focusing on, I have been focusing on recently is pipeline that we have to, I mean, we can go back to middle school, high school and college and so forth, but I'm trying to do things more immediately. So seven years ago, I started a, um, a healthcare administrative fellowship program in which I, it's a national program, actually through something called NAFCAST, in which I asked the organization, well, actually I closed down a program and said, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> and so I hired um, three to five um, master's degree healthcare administrative students from across the country. In fact, I just had a reception for them yesterday for the past five years and I currently have 11. I have been bringing them to, to the hospital. We pay them a full salary for 
whole year, um, put them through rotational programs. And then the goal of the program, my goal is to retain them. This is a program which upfront says we are interested in increasing the representation of under my, underrepresented minorities within the healthcare field and for administrators. I want them to be decision makers. And so I did that five years ago. I've gotten 11 from, I have a 85, 90% um, successful hiring rate for those who are less than St. Children's Hospital, because not everyone is suited for um, pediatrics. They have gone on to CHOF in Boston, but they're still in the field. So I'm trying to do things, not only what's good for me in my home, but we need them in the field. Um, right now, I'm really looking for African-American men. I'm in African descent, and I've gotten, I have had uh, four in the past five years, and they've stayed here. Um, so I'm talking about pipeline, immediate pipeline, and so it's putting your money and your energy into building that pipeline. And once I get them here, it's mentoring them, help them network, and help them find those executive sponsors beyond me um, that will help them understand what the culture is. Um, and for them to, to hang in there, because it's also resilience. They've taken a couple of knocks, as they always do, um, but they need to know, I'm sorry, that's a price tag of being a, a, a black indigenous person of color in the United States, um, working in a predominantly white build. So for me, the answer has been build a pipeline and it's worked so far. I think it's also important that we also begin teaching our children early that they are not a product of their environment that you do not have to be an NBA star, an NFL star. You don't have to be a rapper. <laughs> you know, that it, it is okay to take pride in your education and to be an educated African-American person or a person of color in America. And it's so imperative for us as the adults in, you know, lives. I feel like, although I have twin daughters, 12-year-old twin daughters, although I am a parent to them, the children that I encounter, their friends, people at church, I'm also a parent to them as well too. So I feel it's a personal responsibility that we take on and we teach those around us and encourage them that you do not have to be a product of your environment, but it, it's time to be bigger and think bigger. And I, and I think that part of the issues with creating the pipeline is twofold um, as Dr. West, uh, to share with it as far as building it, you know, as far as taking students, you know, and, and bringing them through the pipeline. That's a major piece. And I, I even in, in my division of HIV prevention, uh, for uh, uh, almost two decades, we've had a pipeline in which we bring um, early uh, uh, scientific investigators of uh, PhDs out of school, schools, and we have a program, a two year program, and in which that we give them opportunities to enhance their research uh, publication record. Um, and also experiences with working with programs of within our division to really kind of get the experience out of graduates because, you know, most folks think getting your dissertation, oh, that's the end of the road. No, that's actually just the beginning. Um, and and, and, and it, it, as, as I'm sad to, to, to tell them, but it's an exciting beginning uh, because, and our programs give, gives those group of um, new investigators, early career investigators, an opportunity to build their resume in, an, or in a government organization uh, that is uh, at the forefront uh, in many key um, activities as from a, a national perspective as it relates to, in our case, HIV prevention. But beyond that, the pipeline, um, that this also calls also for really working internally in our workforce to really build a anti-racist um, workforce and culture. Uh, and, and, and that's not, and, you know, folks, folks get very um, sensitive uh, uh, when they hear those words because and requires difficult conversations to have. Um, and, and it's not easy work. But part of the retent is one thing to get individuals through these pipelines into your organization. It's a whole nother thing to keep them there. And part of keeping them there is to really enhance the workplace culture so that they feel that this is a place that I can grow and thrive. And if you don't have that, even if you're fortunate enough to get a, a, a person of, of color into your workplace, then keep, you know, a happy worker is a worker that stays there for a while. And if they're not happy, they tend to look bolt out the first opportunity that they can for greener pastures. And, and so, and not that folks won't leave just for career growth in general, 
but you want that their time there in your environment to be one in which they seem as a, a positive experience and not one in which they seem to be um, ostracized uh, based on who they are. Um, they, they really want to be judged on what they bring to the table uh, too. But, but as we know, persons of color uh, often have this additional burden that they have to carry um, when they go into any such environment. So really part of the issue is not only bringing the pipeline piece that's on the front end, but on the back end, uh, really enhancing our workplace environment so that once we do have people of color there, that they want to, that, they, that they're, they're allowed to thrive to the best of their abilities without any of this systemic um, barriers that prevent them from thriving regardless of, of, of the skills and, and the work ethic um, that they bring to that work, workplace. Uh, and this is about enhancing opportunities and, 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 and career growth and things of that nature. So I think that's a key piece there that we want to definitely keep the forefront. And I'll just add really quick, um, I echo all the comments because I'm a product of a, a similar pipeline, um, kind of similar probably to Dr. Wise, which she has made at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, I had the similar type of program at the CDC. And that was the beginning of my career because someone, I had the amazing opportunity to start in one of those, I think it was like a minority health, CDC public health internship. And from there, I had a network of people that were with me and now we're all leaders across the country at this point, right? Um, but I think the point I wanna make after that, so pipeline is important, but the positions of power, I know we haven't got to the next question, but everyone has power in the, their roles in whichever seat that they sit. So don't think that you have to be, you know, vice president, director, manager, like how you use your power, and I'm not just talking people of color, everyone, how you use your positions of power and how you use your voice plays a huge role in this, right? I have, I use one of my, now I'll say my favorite coworker because everybody on this call, they're like, who is it? Uh, <laughs> one of my coworkers always speaks up and we don't really talk about it. And it's wonderful because I don't have to say anything, but she is one of those people that are always, that's always going to use her voice. And Angelica doesn't have to do it in the call because she's done a lot of personal work to say, how am I going to use the seat that I sit in to make a difference? And what does that look like? Does that look like where are people of color in this application pool? That's not necessarily our job, but like she's going to ask the hard questions and how are you going to use your voice, right? So I think that is another part to just add another layer of like, don't put the pressure on just one person or just yourself, but what power do you have? You all have power and how are you going to utilize that to advocate for change within your organization? All right, well, thank you guys so much for those responses. Um, we do have another um, audience question. Um, so I'll go ahead and read that now. Um, I am so glad to see all of you doing this work to change our providers from within our institutions. But for those of us who go to healthcare organizations that haven't been lucky enough to have your presence, what can we do as patients to, what can we as patients do to address racism we see from our providers. Um, Dr. Henney, did you wanna go ahead and um, take an answer at that question? Well, I think um, that's a great question and, and, and in many cases, a, a, a challenging one. Um, but I think as a, from a patient perspective, um, and, and it's been kind of uh, expressed earlier in our panel is that um, you know, doing it alone is challenging. It can be done. Everyone has a voice, but there's also power in, in, in collaborating with like minds. And I, for patients that, um, for, from a patient perspective, there are organizations locally um, in, which, um, in which one can reach out to and partner with, whether it's a community-based organization, um, whether it's one in terms of a health department, um, which really um, have additional resources to really kind of follow up on systemic, because we really are talking about systemic, in many cases, systemic issues that, that, that are occurring. Um, and, and so you, you patients def would definitely want to um, reach out to those who are at depth and least familiar with, 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 with these systems and, act and have personnel that can appropriately uh, address or at least take those initial steps to uh, address them. So like with everything else, 
um, being active, whether it's in your, your lo local advocacy community, uh, uh, organizations um, uh, or, or, or any other kind of uh, 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 community-based organization is really going to be key to really give their personal experiences, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of attention, you know, because if you're experiencing it, chances are others are experiencing similar situations as well. Um, but a lot, and a lot of times these organizations do hear of individual stories, but you, but as a patient, as an individual, it is sometimes um, challenging to know um, if others are experiencing this or is this just an isolated incident. So, um, uh, so in many cases, definitely reaching out to local advocacy organizations to raise this. Um, you'll be surprised that uh, once you kind of bring things to light, other folks will say, oh, you had an issue there. I, I, you know, we, you're not the only person that, that has expressed that. Um, so I think that that's a key first step from, from a patient perspective uh, to, to at least address uh, uh, such incidences or experiences. I know for myself personally, um, at the age of 30, um, after having given birth to my twins, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Um, and, and it was two weeks after I had my diagnosed, well, after I had given birth. So I go into my oncologist's office and they gave me my results, you know, kind of in the dirty, dingy closet. Uh, and, you know, he just kind of walked in. He's like, Stephanie died. And I'm like, yes. He's like, so you have cancer and just plops down. So for myself personally and going through that experience, now looking back on it at the age of 43, I called him out on it. You know, and, and I was able to express to him, especially after, you know, he kind of told me about my diagnosis and we talked about my treatment plan that, thank goodness, now we have a closer relationship. But like I told him, you know, when you first had kind of gave me my diagnosis and I explained it to him, I said, you know, I felt like you were very distant. I, you know, I felt disrespected. I was given my results, you know, in a closet. I just given birth to twins. I'm emotional. And then you're telling me seven weeks later, I'm going to have a hysterectomy. So it is the way that I, I was treated and I felt I was disrespected in that moment. And if I was a person that was not of color, I probably would have been in the best conference office or something along those lines. So in my personal experience, I feel that it's best to kind of call people out on what it is. Like I feel that as African-Americans and people of color, we have lived behind, you know, lived in the shadows for too long and have not spoken up. And it's time for us to speak up and to call it out. We will not have change until we begin to call people on their bias and speak on these things and let them know what you're saying and what you're doing is affecting me and this is how it's affecting me. And I will not tolerate it. I'll just add, you know, that one, thank you, Stephanie, for sharing. Um, I also would just add uh, utilizing, you know, your network and asking people and talking about your experiences plays a role. I know I had a not so good experience with a provider. I just wasn't comfortable. And I'm like, this is like the place where I should be at least safe to talk to you about things that I really, that are really important to me and my health. And I just talked to my friends about it and started to have a conversation. And they were like, well, my providers, you know, open and they're accepting new, uh, new patients, um, you know, want me to give you the information? I was like, yes. And that was one of the best decisions I made. So oftentimes, you know, talking to your friends and family about these things, maybe not sharing total personal if you don't want to, but just being involved, like, do you know any providers that are accepting new clients? I think that's one of the hard parts, right? Where, you know, they're not accepting new clients, there's not enough providers, we know that's an issue, but if they are, and asking those questions are so important, because if not, like, leave. Um, if you can <laughs> um, leave, try to find someone that accepts you and brings you, you can bring your whole self and ask the important questions because you're there to, you know, maintain or improve your health. So um, make sure the provider, that's their main intention too. Um, Angelica, this is my post-it. That's my first note is, um, is um, be a consumer. You, I mean, just like you shop around for your car, uh, who you buy a car from, um, you might have Crest one week, you might use Colgate another, I guess also two different brands. I don't just grocery shop, my husband does. Um, but be a consumer um, because your health is all you've got and once you've lose it, you've lost it. Um, so, and then get references. I also have to say working in a, a large hospital is that I understand that not, a, not all our encounters with our patients are positive. Um, and not all patients have psychological safety, and not all patients have the voice 
and the stance that we would take. Um, all of us at the, on this call have multiple degrees. We've had multiple situations where we have to advocate for ourselves. The average American does not have the health literacy to read our forms. The average health literacy in the United States is uh, sixth to eighth grade. We write forms at 12th grade. So we, they come in at a disadvantage. They come in and sit in the room. Um, they've been there for a while. Someone walks in who has three, four or five degrees more than they do, gives a diagnosis, and then they just kind of stand there for your reaction, but their hands on the doorknob, ready to walk out the room. Is it something that I talk to my medical train, my medical residents all the time. Like, what message do you give a patient that you're on your feet, your hand is on the doorknob, it might even be halfway open, and you say over your shoulder, "Do you have any questions?" So, um, so for a patient or the person who asks the questions, understand the situation you're in. Um, I just had a call before this of someone who had a bad situation. Their child has sickle cell. This is not something that they're going to recover from. It's something the child's going to have to live with. And they're unhappy and they're afraid if they say anything to the provider, that will taint the reaction, that will taint the kind of care that the child will have for the lifetime while they're in the pediatric institution before they transfer to an adult. So I always remind myself, I have a lot more assertiveness, I have a lot more privilege of education, income, experiences than perhaps the average patient has. So use the network which is available to you. Most hospitals have a um, patient family referral center in which you can file a concern even anonymously. Um, most hospital centers have um, an evaluation form use it. And you can even do it anonymously. If I say, I was here on Monday, you don't have to say with a physician, this is my experience. We are very, most hospitals who are looking for magnet status or joint commission status and so forth are very sensitive to patient complaints. We actually look at those because it counts. So if there's a, a patient complaint, we're going to pay attention to it. I know you don't, but in this, in this industry, we pay attention because we get dinged if we have a certain number of complaints in a center about a certain kind of care. So use those avenues. Certainly talk to your neighbors and your friends and so forth and, and find a different position. But please, I can't change anything that I don't know about. And when I go to a picnic with my mask on because we're in COVID, or I go someplace and I hear about complaints, so, well, did you say something? Well, no. Well, I can't do anything. I can only respond to that what I know about. So be a consumer, understand your psychological safety. I'm not, ex I'm not telling people to put themselves at jeopardy, but then use the avenues which are available because we do pay attention. Uh, yeah, I do think um, all of you guys made great points, um, especially when it comes to, you know, just being comfortable um, with your health, you know, and who that person that is providing you know, those resources and everything to you, I feel like it's just very important to just, you know, be comfortable with the, with your physician or, you know, whoever it is. And just like, you know, Ms. Dodd said, if you're not, you know, comfortable with something, speak up about it. Um, because a lot of people, you know, they, it's, it's like a revolving door. So it's like, they're just trying to get patients in and out. But once you speak up, if something is not, you know, up to par to your standards or, you know, in my experience, um, I've actually had to, you know, let a couple physicians know, like, you know, I just didn't really like, you know, how I felt rushed. You know, I, I have questions about things that's going on and I just, you know, want to feel like, you know, you you value me being a patient as much as I value you being a physician um, to just educate me about things about my health. So that's definitely some great points that were made there. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> All right, and then, um, so we do have another um, audience question um, and it reads, what is an example of non-explicit biases? Um, as a white woman, the only biases I have ever experienced um, that, I'm sorry, the only biases I have ever experienced um, are that my pain isn't real. I have never experienced racism and I would love to be educated on how to erase these non-explicit biases within myself as a health educator that I may not be aware of. Um, Dr. Hardy, I'm gonna direct that one to you first. I feel like Dr. Wise was gonna chime in oh, first. Okay. <laughs> she was already ready. <laughs> And she probably has all the resources on her yes, head, yes. but I will follow up if. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Weiss, take it away. <laughs> um, 
I'm trying to control my face. And I, um, <laughs> first, I, I guess there's something called about like self education. Um, we all know, and I think uh, Dr. Henry talked about this. We all have biases. So the first thing is like, like, I have no biases. Well, we all got biases. You either drive a Ferrari or you drive a Ford. That's a bias. And in this town, it's Gold Star or the other kind of chili. Um, so we all have biases. So one thing I always tell people, like, there's a great book, easy book, we can read called Waking Up White, written by a white female that talks about when she actually woke up and said, you know what? I have a lot of privilege I never thought about. And then I know people get, you know, there's things that gets tight when I talk about privilege. We all have privilege. I've got privilege, right? We all got privilege. So first of all, self-education. Two is I often ask people to sit down and write down seven names of people that they refer to or call if they have a problem. And you look at the names. So just, you know, write down your names. So look at your phone. Who, who are the thought left past seven people you called? And then identify their race, their ethnicity, the sexual orientation, the gender identity, their religion, their neighborhood, the amount of education, so forth and so on, and see what you find out. Most of us, no blame, no shame. We tend to stay in our own echo chamber. And so that means most of the times, however, blacks actually have a higher degree of having an interracial group of network than whites. And that's because we've had to. Um, so who do you talk to? Then when was the last time you had a group of people to your home and it was multicultural? If I asked your children, well, who does your mother or your father bring invite, invite to your home and who do they have conversations with? Would they say, well, actually, mom, my mom's best friend is a black person and then the neighbor is Hispanic and Asian and so forth. So you need to do some self-evaluation of who do you get your information from formally and informally. I also ask that you think about who, who are your colleagues? What colleagues do you have? If you have all white colleagues, it's more difficult for you to have a day-to-day -day basis. So then you have to go out and you have to create a network. Um, so th for me, it's all about self-education by yourself, not waiting for someone to give you that education and then exploring and going out and testing things. I'm not asking you to find one good black friend because your one good black friend will have a single opinion, but find six, just find eight. Um, the other thing I asked on I'm, I'm all of this is like, what movies do you watch? What books do you read? What blogs are you following? Um, so I, I totally appreciate and bring in the difficulty of writing the questions and as a white woman, how do you know, how do I educate myself as a health educator that may be aware of? And then also test yourself. If this patient was any other color, would I have treated he or she differently? And be really honest. You know, what was your comfort level when you opened the door and it was a Hispanic woman? What was your reaction when you walked in the door? It was an Arab woman, we were in a hijab. Well, you know, so those are the questions you have for yourself. As much as I have to ask more questions when I open the door and it's someone who's signing because they're a part of the deaf community, I know very little about the deaf community and I will own that and say, I don't know much of deaf community. I want you to share with me what are those things I need to think about. And I have to calm down, sit down and listen and then respond. And, and you know, Dr. Weiss, that was, that, 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 that was, that was great there. And uh, I think the only thing I'll add to that is that we are a product of our lived experiences. And if your lived experiences has only been to use Dr. Weiss's uh, analogy, I know I'm not using the exact frame, but your, your echo chain, it's only been there. And you are not familiar with outside of your space. Um, then you should assume, there's very little things you should assume in life, but you should assume that you have some inherent biases um, and some of those biases might, are, are, are likely towards folks that are a different racial, cultural background than yours. And, and, and it's okay to acknowledge that. We all do to a certain extent. Um, but, 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 beyond, but so simply acknowledging that is the first step. Um, so um, it, it's not going to be a cookie cutter um, checkbox. Oh, I could do this and do that. And all of a sudden, I'm an anti-racist person. That that that's not how it works. Um, and this is not to. And it's and when some when a person of color in particular brings up this issue, it's not with the intention at uh, times to to demean the individual who are acting. And we're demeaning the behavior. You know, we're, 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 we're calling out the, 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 the outcome, the, the discriminatory acts, 
not and, and, and it's not the and not necessarily the person and it the and, and so just acknowledging that um there are actions intended or not uh that uh present that that harms other people in subtle ways um including the healthcare setting and it influences how those individuals uh react or respond to in that environment um it is something that um really just needs to it needs to be acknowledged and, and and beyond that then we can begin having a conversation on how to minimize those biases that we all bring to the table um and so um so, so that's all i i have to add and i know angelica i know you were going to respond so uh, I'll i was just they did an amazing job i was just going to say this is continuous work i think that was kind of reiterated but i just want to reiterate this is continuous you can't um read uh, the book that Dr. Weiss uh, suggested and then think, oh, I'm done. Um, this work will be continuous throughout your actually, look, be honest, your whole lifetime because it will change as we get older and we progress and we have more knowledge and we encounter more people and we recognize biases that maybe we didn't even encounter before. Um, I use a great example. I taught in uh, New Hampshire at a boarding school. And to be honest, that was my first known experience of ever teaching students that were Native American. That was my first never had Never, and I learned so much about language that I use, experiences that I just never, not that I know of, um, had ever had students that were Native American. It was very small classes, so I was able to learn a lot. But just think about the biases that I had because I had never actually experienced or met anyone that I knew of. So just being able to say this is continuous work. This is not something that you can just decide like, oh, I'm done. Um, did all my DEI work, I'm ready to go. Uh, so just know that and continue to keep that in your mind continuously. And it will just be growth as you progress in your career or just progress in life. And I think to, to, to uh, Angelica's point, if you're open to, let, 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 let's, let's phrase it this way. If you are personally committed to being your best self, and to grow, then this should not be out, learning about your own personal biases and learn from that should not be outside uh, 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 of that perspective. Um, and, and so embrace it from, from that standpoint um, and, and, and not so much of a, of a defensive posture that I've seen in times where many of, of colleagues who do not share my cultural background uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, take or feel uh, when someone um, uh, challenges on some of their inherent biases and implicit biases um, that, 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 that posture is taken. Um, if your person is an individual that's committed to personal growth um, and, and truly understanding um, not just your world, but other the worlds of others, um, and then this is a conversation that over time, it's not always going to be easy, but over time, uh, it gets easier to, to, to have these conversations and actually um, your, your your interactions with folks outside of you actually become more fruitful than you can ever imagine. But it takes a personal commitment to want to do that. It, it, it really does. And, and it starts with you as an individual wanting and seeing the value in that and being open to continuously doing the personal work that, that, that it requires. And it's for everyone. I, I, I want to make sure, I mean, as a person of color, I'm African American. I have the responsibility to continuously learn something. Um, and so, I, as I mentioned, other races, I, I have a son who is Hispanic, an adopted son. And so, I'm really schooled myself on what does it mean to be Hispanic in the United States. And being Spanish speaking does not mean everyone's from Mexico, first of all. First of all. And there's different cultures within that, within that Hispanic Latina um, culture. Um, it also means that different religions. Um, Angelica, I was raised on a Native American boarding school campus. Um, I moved there when I was 18 months old, and left when I was 12 or 13. So it was fascinating for me as a child. That was the culture I was steeped in. And then I was moved to Saginaw, Michigan, where I integrated the high school. And so I was, so I was like, okay, what, so what's going on here? I mean, why are people feeling this way about Native Americans? Because I knew them from my lived experience. And why are people treating Blacks like this? Because I didn't have them experience as a Black experience, but they were treating me in a certain way in a very kind of a caste system. And so I'm all, so that was my childhood, but then I'm always learning something new. And so for the question, I want her to know, it's not just being white in which you have to be culturally competent. We 
I feel a responsibility to be culturally competent in all areas and with all kinds of peoples and walks of life. And so I've challenged myself, as Dr. Honey was saying, I challenge myself to be more comfortable and saying, I don't know, I made a mistake. Oops, that's a bias, I didn't know it. And I still, find myself, I still call myself a good person. So I don't think I'm a bad person because I have these, these problems, these issues, but I'm a, I continuously challenge myself. And it does get easier because I'm just more willing to admit what I don't know and then go out and get some answers. All right, yeah, those were some great responses. Definitely, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed that question. <laughs> All right, and then we have a, um, another very good question. Um, how can the public health system start to build trust among African-Americans and other people of color, given all the historic wrongs that are now impacting these community vaccination rates? And we will direct that to Mrs. Dodd. I think most definitely, being totally honest, education is uh, number one. Um, getting out in communities of color, educating, and I'm not just expecting that everyone has the same um, ability or accessibility to the internet or even having Wi-Fi or different things like that. But I feel like in an African-American community that um, we communicate better person to person when we could see someone, when we could hear someone, we could have open, honest feedback. So in an uh, instance like that, especially with, uh, I work at Planned Parenthood to be totally honest and transparent. Uh, and we know our history at Planned Parenthood. It was built off of uh, our founder, Margaret Sanger was built off of uh, eugenics, had a belief in eugenics and things along those lines. So in that aspect, um, we know that uh, experimentation was held in the African-American community and that uh, things along those lines in nature, uh, we are not too trusting when it comes to doctors that we will rather say, if I'm having a health issue, I can deal with it, I'll pray over it before we go to the doctor or anything like that. However, in this instance, I feel that education is number one, that as organizations such as you know Planned Parenthood or other community organizations, we have to be present and show up for our uh, you know, people of color community and our black community. We have to outwardly uh, stand with uh, issues against uh, standing against and speaking out against racism, saying that we stand with black people and being vocal about our marketing and different things along those lines. And our marketing has to cater to our communities of color. I guess I'll go, or Dr. Henny, you wanna go? Sure, uh, just quickly, um, uh, if that's possible, knowing my reputation is just being wrong with it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, it, uh, it's really going to take really committing to health equity um, uh, from the public health uh, industry. And I'm, I'm talking about from, from government to, um, to community-based organizations. Uh, to individuals is being really committed to health equity and understanding that um, most of the, the, the issues that we face, the hesitancy from the community is really due to the fact that not even acknowledging that there's systemic forces in place in our system that really um, inhibits every person, every population, every community from getting the optimal health care that they need. Um, and, and, and so it's first to acknowledge that those uh, systemic forces that are there, when I say systemic forces, I'm, you know, it's really to acknowledge that folks' health si situations are beyond them just with their individual behaviors. You know, it is also an outcome of their circum social context and circumstances. You know, for example, if, um, it, it, if I need health care, but I have to take two or three trains, um, buses, you know, a cab ride just to get to my doctor when other communities can simply just walk to get quality help. That is a systemic bias. That's a systemic barrier there. You know, if, if, if there are, in terms of from a nutritional standpoint, um, if having um, grocery stores, within a five mile radius 
is one thing, but yet in other communities, it's literally like maybe 15, 20 miles to get to a quality uh, a, 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 a grocery store, not the convenience store at the gas station. You know, that is a systemic barrier. And there are all these systemic barriers that impact our health outcomes. So first and foremost, from a public health perspective, we have to acknowledge that there are these social um, uh, barriers and contexts that inhibit our health outcomes beyond than the individual behaviors themselves. And, and, and a lot of times in, in, in healthcare, we tend to reduce um, all health-related problems to your individual behaviors. And there are other biases that are so acknowledging that. Um, is key. And not only to acknowledge that, but then how do we then go about addressing some of those barriers um, from a programmatic standpoint, if you're talking about from a public health standpoint, you know, in terms of how do you, uh, the science, you know, the analysis that you do to discover better uh, evidence-based interventions that can, that, that can address some of these barriers. That's going to be key. Um, in terms of community-based organizations, I really have to partner with community-based organizations that have inroads into communities uh, that do feel left out of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the uh, of benefiting from high-quality healthcare uh, system um, to, to have better outreach. They're partnering with organizations that have those inroads uh, so that the resources can get to the people um, where they're at, versus the mindset of, oh, build the building and they will come. No, we need to meet the people where, where, where they are. So um, these are just some of the, from a public health standpoint, um, and, and then not only that, and I'll say this one thing, that's sort of like the external work that needs to be done. There also needs to be some internal work in some of these organizations as well, um, because these individual biases that we speak about also permeate in terms of um, within the workforce, in terms of the perspectives, uh, the collective perspective. Um, uh, that, 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 that is involved in terms of uh, developing some of these programs and what have you. And then again, we talked about earlier, uh, developing a diverse workforce, not just in diverse in terms of culture, but diverse in terms of perspective, you know, of lived experiences. So that's all going to be needed, you know, to develop um, programmatic um, and policy and the science that's responsive to the needs of the communities that we serve. Um, and, and so to me that those are all kind of the challenges that we need to face, but we, we first, you know, I think a key part of that is really kind of acknowledging uh, these, uh, uh, that healthcare is beyond than just individual behaviors. It, it really involves uh, so much more than that, that folks are, uh, that, that, that have to encounter in their everyday lived lives. And, and that's where we really need to start and, and to work from there. Uh, I'll add uh, the, the, uh, uh, with an anonymous attendee, but attendee who answered, asked the question, the word you used was build, build trust. That's number one. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. We've talked about a lot of things. They seem continuous, but they are. We didn't get here overnight. The, you know, the history of our organizations often um, that has a some uh, definitely a past that we often don't like to talk about, but we need to. And I appreciate Stephanie bringing up, like we have to be transparent about where we started and then let's see where we're going. And then let's also talk the talk and walk the walk. So, you know, often public health peeps everywhere have been using health, public uh, health equity for a while, but like, are we gonna do it or are we just gonna talk about it? And those are the type of things that we have to keep pushing those buttons. Like, let's get it done. What does this look like? How are we going to change together? Um, and like, what does that trust look like? I also think um, listening. So one of the biggest things that I think have been I, like personally been successful is just really sitting down and listening and realizing a lot of times in these positions of leadership and organizations, we do not know the answers. And if we don't ask the communities what the concerns are, some of the best conversations, you mentioned vaccines, some of the best conversations I've had on that, about vaccines have been one-on-one, -on -one, small group, sometimes we at a coffee house, sometimes we might be at a bar, <laughs> outside, uh, messed up. But we're, it's different conversations, but it's like, who is your trusted voice? Where are you getting that information from? But how, who's answering those questions? And the people that have asked me are like, she's not gonna judge me based on the question that I ask. She's gonna provide me with education. She's listening to my concerns and we cannot build trust unless we listen. 
And then we can come with all of our language and our stats and all of that, but we have to build trust by listening to our community, um, being that trusted voice, but you have, to, you have to value the voice of the community that you're trying to serve. So that is extremely important. And I had a third point, but I can't remember it. That was like the bigger point, but building it and listening <laughs> were the important parts I wanted to uh, make sure I said. <laughs> Oh, and walk in the walk and do the talk. I did all three. We're good. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys for those responses. Again, like I said, that was another great question. So I'm so glad um, that I was able to get those opinions from you guys and for our um, question asker um, from the chat. So thank you. Um, and then next, we just have a, um, a statement, it looks like from uh, Andrea, um, just wanted to say, I always tell people um, that they need to be proactive in their health care, um, physically and mentally. Um, and if they are not, then they get a lesser degree of interaction with the medical field. Um, so I, me personally, I do agree with that. Um, I do believe, you know, you definitely need to have um, that extra pushing yourself to want to do things, you know, to keep your health together and to know, you know, what's going on. And is the more you have that, um, that proactiveness and that education on that, then I feel like the more easier it'll be to interact um, just with different people in the medical field. So yeah, does anyone want to um, comment on Can that? I add one thing? If you don't do not have the answers or don't know how to pre- be proactive, just being able to ask the questions because not all of us come with that knowledge. You know, I think it was Dr. Wisen mentioned, like we all have, you know, degrees, we work in the field. We are definitely at an advantage when we go into the medical because we're like, oh no, we know that's not right. Or we know this should be done this way. So, but asking questions and do not be shy at asking questions, I think is another way to add that. Like, I know that's not going to be easy the first time, but just building up to be like, I always have a list of questions. I have like 10. She already knows when I come in, I'm going to have all these questions that I'm going to ask, but just starting with something to get you more comfortable. And that will help you build that if you don't feel as confident, you know, advocating for your mental and physical health immediately, but hopefully to build on that, just asking questions is all I wanted to add. Yeah, Angelica, I thought that was a great point as well, too. I was just going to chime in and say that also being prepared before you go to your doctor's appointments. I'm also a type of person like I will prior to going to the doctor's appointment, have a list of questions. I'm like a 10 question person as well, too. So I feel like also knowing, you know, what you're going to your doctor's appointment for doing your own research and just being prepared. All right, well, thank you guys for that. Definitely agree um, with both of those statements. Um, and then we have another question. Um, how can we address biases towards individuals living with HIV within the healthcare, educational, and employment settings? Um, in my mind, HIV adds an additional barrier to accessing all of the above. Um, so what is your personal experience? And I will direct that to Dr. Hay. That's a huge question. Um, <laughs> there's um, there's so many facets, um, but but it really kind of goes back to a lot of the previous comments that we shared. Um, really, in terms of um, addressing and, and uh, addressing, we're really talking about stigma um, in many cases, and, and really it's kind of addressing it head on. Um, Fortunately, I think, if I, I can speak in generalities, I think that since the inception of, uh, you know, the 80s and the onset of HIV AIDS to now, we have had progress on many fronts. Um, I think society as a whole, you know, uh, and a lot of times, you know, uh, being stigmatized with HIV um, overlaps with other st stigmatization. Um, it could be a stigma against uh, 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 the, the LGBT com community, it's a stigma uh, overlay that. Um, in many cases, it could be overlaid with poverty, stigma associated with poverty, stigma associated with, 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 with uh, you know, race, you know, ra racial uh, 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 discrimination. Um, it, it, it's a lot of layers. So it, it, in many cases, from one instance to another, th th there's multiple um, uh, uh, isms 
that are often you know, you know uh, associated with that. But like with everything else, you got, I think it was mentioned earlier today, you have to first call it out. I, I think you have to first acknowledge it, ask the question um, and, 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 and ask them, you know, uh, I would say be direct. Um, you know, if, if it's something explicit, you call it out. If it's something that is more implicit, um, I would, with your 10 questions, ask your provider, um, how many of your clients are HIV positive? How many of, are you comfortable with serving members from the LGBT, you know, community? Um, you know, things of that nature. I mean, uh, you know, these are questions that as you, I think um, to use Dr. Weiss's uh, 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 wording earlier, you have to almost approach this from a consumer standpoint. These individuals are working for you. Um, they are getting compensated, whether through your insurance companies or, or direct payment or whatever the case might be, because you're seeking services from them. Um, and so um, being empowered to um, one, um, you know, asking questions in which you feel like you're, you're being um, uh, discriminated against in some way is going to be key. Um, and then um, if you feel like you're not getting the services you need, feel empowered to lodge a complaint, you know, to their supervisor. No different than if you were at a uh, restaurant and you're not getting the service that you need, you go complain to the manager in many cases. And in many cases, you know, our comfort levels will feel more comfortable doing those kinds of things. But you should, we need to normalize um, accountability uh, from our healthcare providers as well. And so I think that that's, the, that's just one small piece, one small step to um, uh, uh, an issue that can be um, addressed from a, a range of, uh, of areas from, you know, you know, public health advocacy uh, through your healthcare department um, and, and others. But I'll just stop there for now and, and let my other colleagues uh, weigh in uh, on that topic. Um, Ms. Dr. Weiss, um, did you want to add something to that question? I like to stay in my lane, and I'm just, this is not my lane. <laughs> I will say same, it's not my lane, or I would definitely give y'all my opinion. You know I'm not shy so far in this hour, right? Uh, it's not my lane. <laughs> um, I would just say that I agree with everything that Dr. Henney said. Um, I cannot add anything to the comment, but it was a great response. All right. All righty. Well, yeah, I'll definitely agree with you guys on that one. That was great. So <laughs> I think that was answered pretty well. Um, and then we just have another question here. Um, are there any advocacy groups in Cincinnati um, that I can refer clients to if they feel they cannot advocate for themselves or are too afraid of the backlash that they may receive? And I will um, just open that to anyone who wants to respond um, to that question. I'll go um, just to say, I think a lot of the organizations are often, that do a lot of advocacy work are based on the healthcare need. So there are a lot of organizations focused on like maternal health. There are a lot of organizations focused on HIV. So I think the best path I would say is that I'm not super aware of like advocates that are from a holistic perspective that can help you in every aspect, um, but definitely more, you know, um, health condition specific. Um, and then they can kind of lead you down that path. But please tell me if I'm wrong. But that was when I first saw the question, that was what I thought. I have to agree with Angelica. Um, Angelica. Um, I'm on the board of an organization called Living with Change. It's, it's here in Cincinnati, but it's a national program. And it's specifically targeted towards the support and education of children, adoles children adolescents, parents, and adult caretakers of um, transgender teens, um, which is a um, growing need. Cincinnati Children's Hospital has the fastest growing transgender clinic in the United States, fastest growing, not the largest. Largest goes to, so that credit goes to um, Boston General. But I think there is a lot of education that needs to be done in that space. So I think you need to be targeted in what you're looking for. Um, again, asking questions and get into the community, go into chat lines, go into um, blogs and so forth, because not only do you find out who's doing the work, 
but who's doing the best work. Um, just because someone has the marquee and they are known for that work does not mean they're doing the best work. So it's again, doing your own self-education, asking some questions. And then again, I'm all about being a consumer. Um, trial it out. If it doesn't work for you, keep moving. I find it interesting, actually, um, um, there was a research that people are more likely to criticize the dinner they had at the restaurant than then to give a critique to the doctor. I like to flip that. I mean, I've had some bad meals and I've survived it. You may not survive bad medical care. I might have to steal that, Dr. Wise. That might, I'm going to steal it. I'm taking it. Y'all, it's recorded here. I'm stealing it. If you hear it again. Yes, absolutely. Um, I wholeheartedly agree um, with that. Um, I think I might have to steal that too, because that is a really, really good example. And it it literally just breaks it down um, a lot easier that, you know, if you're this comfortable with, you know, complaining about this, then you should definitely feel a lot more comfortable uh, making sure that your health care is um, provided to you correctly. So I, I definitely, definitely agree with that. Thank you. All right, and then um, we do, um, looks like we have a, another question here in the audience box. Um, what can be done in educational institutions to create a pipeline of more diverse workforce? And I will direct that question to uh, Ms. Dobb. Jamara, can you repeat the question for me again? Sorry, sure. <laughs> um, it is what can be done in educational institutions um, to create a pipeline of, of a more diverse workforce? Hmm, that's a really great question. I think um, most definitely, I, I am one that will say advocate, advocate, advocate for yourself. Uh, most definitely lift things up. When you see that the environment around you is not one that is fitting for you, you have to speak up. You have to say what your needs are and not be um, afraid to shake the boat um, in so much instance. I, I think a lot of times that when I approach things, I'm not only thinking of it benefiting myself, but how's it gonna benefit my children in 20 years? How's it gonna benefit those around me? So I like to build things that are sustainable. And I like to think of, on, of along things on that level. If I speak up now, it will help a generation that's coming behind me. So in that instance, I feel that um, speaking up, most definitely advocating for yourself, stating these are the needs. I've noticed that, you know, this is not, uh, this, this is not here. However, what is it that I need to do to get this uh, going? I uh, most definitely feel like uh, going to the DEI board, if there is one, um, but stating those things and talking about those things and being more inclusive and uh, most definitely going to the dean of uh, students and dean of offices on a lot of campuses. Yes, I'll go. Um, I think it happens, you said Maybe. educational institutions, but I think even earlier, you know, starting with just exploration of what different um, like healthcare workforce, like what that looks like. Um, I know getting even at, even younger than high school age, just exposure to what that looks like, like what you can be. Um, and also, also just thinking outside of the traditional um, doctor and nursing that we hear all the time, just healthcare as a large scope who can be in health administration. I know I didn't learn about public health until I was well, <laughs> too far down the line in college on becoming a physician. So I'm on the right side of where I wanna be, but I didn't know about, I just didn't know. I didn't have the knowledge and the information. So I think that pipeline is exposure early and continuous advocate, continuously advocating whatever role. I know we mentioned this earlier, just continuously advocating whatever seat you sit in. So I've had some amazing college counselors that were like, you love to talk, but like you are really, not doing well in this whole, like, you sure you want to be a physician? And I was like, I don't, I don't. that's what I thought I was supposed to do. That's what everyone said that I should do. Um, and definitely exposed me to this place, but just had whatever seat you can be in this seat, being a health educator, you can be a academic counselor at different institutions, guidance counselor at high school. So 
creating pipeline at every place. Um, and I know maybe not all those people are on this call today, um, but how can we start to do that is so important. Um, I know Cincinnati Public Schools has different pipeline programs, but they're only at certain schools sometimes. So thinking about kind of where those gaps are and then how we can ex um, expose students and then also want to make a career change. I also think that's important too, right? How are How is that pipeline there if you decide to go back to school and become a nurse? You know, I have friends that are in public health for years and now they're like, now I'm, I'm ready to be on the front lines. Like, I want to do this. So how do I become a public health nurse? and do this uh, the same way. So I think in multiple seats, in multiple areas of education, um, we must continue to create them. I know we just have to continue to do it. Sorry, <laughs> it's not a recipe, but Dr. Wise has an amazing program that she started and look who we are now, so it's great. Um, thanks for the, for the, the plug-in for my administrative fellowship program, which I'm actually interviewing for right now for FY23. Um, you know, we did some QI work, uh, quality improvement work with our pipeline programs between the um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, and the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and our research foundation here to find out pipeline. And pipeline is absolutely important, but we did some QI work with it thinking, well, do we have all the answers? Like how do you build a pipeline? How do you identify pipeline? How do you um, sponsor a pipeline? How do you advertise and so forth? And the surprising variable for that perhaps everyone knew except for us was parents are the key. Because when you think about pipelines, um, elementary school, middle school, so, so forth, those kids can't drive. They don't get the information um, in, a, in a form that they can easily understand, respond to and interpret. Um, even in high school, you know, a lot of high schoolers now don't drive. Um, their, their whole life is in social media and things like that. And we're seeing a tank in as far as the 16, 17 year journals getting a driver's license. But parents are adult figures, as we know, not all children live with parents, but adult figures, children aren't living by themselves. They drive aspiration. If we can get to the parents and say to the third, fourth grade parent, did you know that your child can be X, Y, and Z? I mean, I would love a good fireman. You know, they don't have to be CEOs. I would love um, a good teacher. Lord knows we need teachers. Um, all those things, a plumber. Have you, any of you tried to get a plumber recently? Electrician into your home? Um, they make good money. But if we can start to go back and educate the parents, the grandparents, and the adult figures in these children's lives. High school counselors, elementary school counselors have caseload of a hundred, couple, hundred, couple hundred kids. And so we need to stop saying it's their job to direct these children into the pipelines. But if we can get to the parents, and if we can give them the information and give them the aspirations for their children, and again, maybe y'all knew this, but we were stunned. And I thought, that makes sense. Like, what are the parents doing? And what kind of information do they have directly versus saying, well, I put the note into the child's backpack. I mean, if you have children, have you ever seen that wad of paper representing the note that the teacher gave you? And you unwrinkle it to kind of read it if it gets home. But and for me, what I've, I've decided we have to get to the parents or the adult figures of these kids um, and post information in a way that the parent can then use it, guide it, and also help the child to make some decisions and also to push them in a direction perhaps they had never dreamed about. I'm in a career that my father never dreamed about. My father was not allowed to go to school because he was raised in segregated education era. And so the dream came from somebody else. So we have to put these dreams in these um, kids' ears and, let, and then help them come to fruition. And, I, I, and, and to couple with those great comments, I, the, the only thing I'll add here is that, you know, and I'm speaking among the existing pipeline programs that are there. Um, like everything else, we have to constantly evolve and adapt to the current times. Uh, I think just much, no different than marketing uh, the, these, these corporations that are marketing a product. And you know they have a whole marketing team that's designed to be responsive to the changes and needs of the habits, behaviors, attitudes of, the, of their potential market and, and, and channel their, their approach uh, based on that information. Um, we need that level of sophistication among the existing pipelines to be responsive, to meet, again, kind of going back to this theme, meeting the folks where they're at, you know, and, and reaching out to there. Um, and, and also to address some of these, uh, again, I would say these, these social structural barriers. Um, in my experience, 
the schools or the programs that often receive these information related to these uh, great internship opportunities and things of that sort, tend to be the same. I, 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 so I would say the higher achieving in, in institutions and then therefore the institutions of which uh, oftentimes aren't seen in that realm don't system, systemically don't get that information. Uh, and so there needs to be broadening of outreach in terms of exposure uh, because you cannot take advantage of what you don't know. Uh, first and foremost. And, and, I, and, and so I think there's just general effort, just even among the pipeline programs that we have now, just to even to expand their reach. And that's challenging because every program met with, with everyone's resource challenge. Um, but, but that's where the challenge is, uh, in addition to increasing the number of, of opportunities and, and programs that are out there too. But, but that'll be um, just a thought that I want to share. Uh, in, in terms of a, a small piece to 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 that bigger puzzle. Yes, thank you guys for those responses. Um, and then we do just have one final question um, that we have for our session. Um, in a hospital setting, if I see someone who is above me treating people differently and I suspect it is because of racism or some sort of bias, how do I address that in a way that doesn't put them on the defense? And I will direct that to Dr. Hardy. I don't feel like that's for me because I'm not in a hospital setting. So I'm sorry, Dr. Wise, but. <laughs> what? You're actively there. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm sitting here in a hospital, literally. Um, um, the question is a real one. We, um, I was saying, I just got off a call before I jumped on this one from someone who actually expressed something like this. It's so interesting. Um, we have processes um, for all kinds of complaints. Um, as far as parking complaints or um, didn't get a promotion and what the evaluation is, a performance evaluation and so forth and so um, But when it comes to something as subjective um, as racism, it's much harder to identify because um, in our hospital, most of our supervisors are white. I'm not out in the hospital, but that's healthcare. And most of our individual contributors are African-American or people of color. And so the likelihood of me um, being treated by someone who's different than I in a, um, in a hierarchical sense is I'm going to be bumping up perhaps against someone who does not have the experiences that many of us had, or as Dr. Uh, Henny so well stated, um, they're going to be in an echo chamber, not of their fault, is that we're all in our echo chamber and they're, we're all subject to our upbringing. So how do you do it in such a way that it can be non-defensive? I can't control someone else's behavior and, and how they respond to me. But what I can say, and I think um, Ms. Dobbs said this, you know, we can go to them saying, hey, you know that situation we just had? It's not feeling, it's not resting well with me. Can we rework that? Um, now, many times a person said, well, I don't know anything you're talking about. What, what went on? I'm saying, well, I approached you and you were laughing at a joke that I found offensive. And they say, oh, what, what joke? So you need to prepare yourself because a person probably either, either didn't mean anything to them because it just, it washed right over them or they know what they did and you're calling out something that's kind of embarrassing because most of us like to be perceived as good people. And in a hospital se setting, we all like to perceive that we were culturally competent. Um, and so you're going to put them on the defensive, but if you can objectively repeat what you've experienced and say that hurt and it hurt because when you did this, and you said this, I felt this way. In the future, could we agree that you'll reconsider your response? So I want you to give them an out. Does it mean you're running around the bush? Yeah, probably. But in a working set of situation, you'll probably have to work with that person numerous times and not be able to walk away and never see them again. So you're also trying to provide them with education. And I'm saying as a black female, when you talked about this person being looking like a spook, that hurt me because in my childhood, it means this, right? So it's also an opportunity to educate. Again, you cannot control how they're going to feel, but you can provide education. You can ask for partnership. 
You can tell them how you feel. And you can ask them also to reconsider reaction to a similar situation in the future. But I do ask you to do it because we, what we've examining, examining right now is that we are finding that the stress and the sense of exhaustion is the highest among our people of color, particularly blacks right now. And that's because I think we're swallowing and not responding so much, which is happening to us. And it does not go away. It's called hypertension. It's called headaches. It's called heart disease. It's called depression. It's called anxiety. It's called all these different things because you swallow it. It does not go away. It just manifests in other ways. Thank you so much for that response. Um, that definitely um, put a lot of insight um, and actually gave me and I'm sure others um, a different mindset about that question um, with that answer. So I do appreciate that. Um, and at this time, um, I do want to thank um, all of our panelists for their opinions and just everything with this discussion. Um, you guys have been great, and I just really appreciate you taking the time out of your days to just come and speak with us here at the conference.